Another episode of Words of Grace starts now, featuring a new grace-filled message each week as Acts 433 Church brings the gospel to you through the teaching ministry of Dr. Matthew Webster. It is wonderful to be with you at the Words of Grace Bible Study Ministry of Acts 433 Church. Now, if you would like to check what we're all about online, visit us at acts433.com. You can also support us financially, most easily by visiting sharethegospel.world. Try to make it as easy as we can for people to find the information they need to know about us. We're in part four of the Grace Killer series, which will take us to the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews is a really cool book, and there are some things that you probably already know about it, but you might not even be aware of what you already know about this book. For instance, who was the book of Hebrews written to? If you said the Hebrews, <clears throat> you'd be right. It's written to the Israelites. I've got another question for you, and I bet you're going to get this one right as well. So, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Now, if you said, I don't know, you'd be right too. We actually don't know the authorship of who wrote the book of Hebrews. We're not 100% sure. Now, a lot of scholars believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, I'm not so sure about that because the literal style of how the book of Hebrews is written doesn't seem to match his other books. Like, if you've had the opportunity to go on acts433.com and maybe you've ordered some of my books, you realize that, that I've got a certain literary style in how I write. Uh, my books are similar because I'm the author of them. Now, if you're going to read a bunch of the books that I've written, and then you take a break, and you read another author in the same genre, you know, a Christian literature type book, you're going to notice right away that they have a style in their writing that differs from mine. And so I personally don't believe that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews because the literary style is just too different. Others believe that maybe Barnabas wrote it. Uh, but there is a major clue that we do find out about who wrote it. Uh, in Hebrews 2.3, he says that he was taught by an apostle. That's a pretty interesting clue there. So, who do I think wrote the book of Hebrews? Dun, dun, dun. I believe that Hebrews was actually a sermon that Paul preached that Luke transcribed. The style matches closely to Luke, and being a physician, he had a mastery of the Greek language. And when you take a verse like Hebrews 2, 3 that says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. It seems likely that Luke is penning Paul's spoken words, a message, a sermon that Paul delivered. I could be wrong, but the important part isn't so much who wrote it, but what does it say? And particularly, what does it have to say to us today for our Grace Killer series? So let's find out in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Hebrews 12, 15. Wow, there are so many questions to begin with. Like, how do we see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God? And also, how do we make sure that no bitter root grows up in us? What this verse is telling us is that a bitter root will cause trouble, not just for the individual that it grows from, but it'll affect many. A bitter person will impact those around them. Life experience can confirm this for all of us. You know, when you're around someone who's bitter, it just has a way of just impacting those people who are near them. Now, the answer to the two questions I just asked a moment ago is actually found in the text. We just have to break it down, and I'm excited to do that with you today. Because today is a day, as we spend time in the Word, 
that we're going to receive more and more of God's grace. See to it. That phrase there in the Greek means to look upon or be aware. So be aware that no one falls short of the grace of God. This doesn't mean that we fall off from grace, uh, because grace is a gift of God. Adam Clark's commentary says that the writer is actually speaking of the gospel here. He's saying, see to it, church leaders, that the flock, your congregation, those who are saved, that they don't fail to continue to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. The opposite of the gospel of grace is the law. I can tell you what makes bitter roots grow from a person's life is somebody who will try to live under the law. We'll see this as we progress in the text. In fact, a person who lives under the law, the text tells us that person will cause trouble and defile many. The word defile in the Greek is a word picture, and it means to stain, and it's referring to defiling with sins. So imagine this glass of water that I have that's clear, you can see right through it, beautiful, represents grace. And what Paul would write to the Galatians is you cannot take grace and then mix it with even a single drop of the law. Because when you do that, it defiles and it stains, as you can see in this illustration. That's exactly what that word picture means in the Greek. And that is why Paul wrote to the Galatians in this way, and you'll see how it matches with this verse that I'm talking about here. You who are trying to be justified by the law, you have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. That's Galatians 5.4. So how do we make sure individuals don't fall short of the grace of God? Another way to say it is, how do you spot a counterfeit to grace? Well, do you know what experts in currency do and how they can detect a counterfeit bill? They do this by studying the original. They know the original so well that they can easily tell when something is not supposed to be there. Bitterness is like the growing of a weed. And one year I was gardening and I had planted a lot of new perennial flowers. The next year, uh, when the perennials started to return, I didn't know them well enough what the original was supposed to look like. So I was actually faithfully watering one plant that turned out to be a giant weed. Well, thanks to a gardening friend who said, what are you doing? You're cultivating a weed. When you try and live under the law, it's causing a bitter root to grow up in your life. And law-based living will suck others into the same thing. It is staining other people as you're making it about something other than the finished work of Jesus Christ. If you don't receive the grace God gives through Jesus Christ, then the seed is set for the root of bitterness to grow through self-righteous living. How do people fall short from the grace of God? Earlier, I put that verse from Galatians up, which actually tells us in chapter 5, verse 4, it says, You who are trying to be justified by the law, you have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. When you fall from grace, what that means is Christ becomes of no effect. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, and the lepers all received from Jesus. But the Pharisees, who boasted in their own efforts to keep the law, didn't receive from Jesus. And so when you boast in your, in, in your own efforts, in your law-keeping abilities you'll fall short of grace every time. 
So let's go ahead and look at the verse that led into our verse today. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That's verse 14. Paul Ellis said, when the New Testament writers exhort us to be holy, they're actually calling us to live out our true Christian-born identity. Now, this does not come naturally. Our experience is in living in a sick and broken world, and it has not equipped us to relate to the one who is healthy and whole. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, said the Holy One, Matthew 5, 48. The word for perfect means complete or full grown. It means whole. And so Jesus is saying, be whole as your Father in heaven is whole. He was calling us to the life that is His. But there is more in this progression of the text that will take us to an Old Testament figure in the Bible. As we continue in verse 15, it says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. should be really familiar with that. And then moving on to the next verse, verse 16, See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Long before there's fornication or profanity, there is first falling from grace. So we have a contrast of what receiving grace produces versus what a person who lives apart from the grace. So apart from grace, the person develops a deep-rooted issue with bitterness. The person is challenged in the area of sexual uh, immorality, lust, porn addictions, affairs. Their speech is profane. But receiving the grace of God produces peace with all men, wholeness, holiness, which is wholeness, health in soul, body, and mind. How do you know you have fallen short of grace? Well, that's when you are law conscious, meaning you're performance-based conscious. There are two examples of characters in the Bible who fell into bitterness and sexual immorality because they were law conscious and performance conscious that I want to share with you. Uh, the first was Esau, which was mentioned directly in the text. He fell from grace by being performance-oriented. He despised his birthright and he sold it for food, thinking that he would still get the firstborn blessing because he could somehow earn his father's life, love by his performance, by his great hunting ability, bringing back wild game. But Isaac could not give him the firstborn blessing once he had already given it to Jacob. And so as a result, Esau ended up bitter and sexually immoral. And then there was the uh, older brother in the parable of the prodigal son. It says, so the older, the speaking of the older brother, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. It's in Luke 15, 29 through 30. He says some things here, and I really want to highlight this. The older son says, I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Well, what does that sound like? That sounds like law-based living. The older brother thought that he had to earn and that he actually could earn his father's blessing. But obviously, it's impossible to never have transgressed against your parents. That's an impossibility. This law consciousness and performance consciousness produce bitterness 
and lust issues. So he says this. He says, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. He's bitter about the fact that his father was so gracious to his younger brother. And he specifically called out the sins of his younger brother, indulging in harlots. And one of the things that you'll discover is that people call things out in others because they see those things in themselves. That's what happens with those who are living under the law. In this statement, the older brother actually revealed his problem with lust, but his father responded with grace. And the father said to him, Child, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. The older brother never saw that all that his father had was his. And because he could not see this, the word that the father used on him was actually the word child in the Greek. And what this indicates is his lack of ability to fully walk in his inheritance. Now let's contrast that with how the father addressed his younger son who received grace. For this, my son, it means full-grown son with privileges, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Luke 15, 24. The story of the prodigal son teaches us that as soon as we turn back to grace, Luke 15, 24, we are as that full-grown son able to access the abundant life that God has prepared for us in Christ. My prayer for our listening audience is that we might live in the full, abundant life that Jesus died to give us. That when we recognize God our Father's constant supply of grace to us, that is when we are living under grace. Life has a lot of demands that are placed on us. Next time life's demands flood your mind, look away from them and see his supply of grace upon grace instead, and receive all that you need from him. When you wake up every morning, say, Lord, I see your supply of grace flowing toward me right now. It's more than enough for every single demand that I will face today. Amen. What a great way to end our time in this, uh, in this message. I want to go ahead and take our last few minutes together praying that you will see the supply of God's grace on the way and that you will receive it, that you'll step into your inheritance that is given to you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. Uh, what a great great time it was to get into the book of Hebrews. Uh, even though we don't know for sure who wrote it, man, it is a great word for all of us. I know that the enemy would desire that we would not receive your grace, that we would become performance oriented, that we would have our lives stained by trying to live under the law instead of resting in the finished work of Christ. Um, Lord, I just, uh, I know that when we do that, the devil has a way to try to condemn us and bring guilt and shame into our lives because uh, we mess up. And when we don't see how perfectly forgiven we are, and we don't see what Christ has done for us, it just causes us to continue to walk uh, after the flesh and continue to try to live more and more under the weight of the law which none of us could, and that's why Jesus came to fulfill the law's demands on our behalf. Lord, I pray for the men and women who have tuned into this message, that they will, in fact, start their day seeing your supply of grace filling their lives for the very demands that are placed upon them today. Lord, you give us uh, each day, our daily bread, exactly what we need, our sustenance, that we will trust you 
that you've given us everything we need for this day, that we do not have to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough in itself to worry about, that we would just be focused in the present, in what you have given us, what you are doing in our lives, and your precious promises in your word. Man, we will just uh, propel us forward to have peace with all men, to live whole like our Father in heaven is, to have health in our body, soul, and mind, and to just really go forth letting our light shine in the darkness of this world. I am just grateful for the time we have each week to get into your word, to see what the Holy Spirit will reveal, uh, pointing us to Christ, our victor. We give you all the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts 433 Church, bringing the gospel to you.